Okay, we're going to start now. I'm, I'm Roger Watson. I'm the Vice President of the MCUP. We are recording this lecture. Um, I will record the lecture up until the end of the actual talk and then I'll, I'll turn it off for about 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answer. And I'm now going to hand over to our President, Janet Wilson, to introduce Sir Anthony Selden. Thanks, Janet. Thank you very much, Roger, and greetings, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see such a large number of you um, as the president of NCUP and having been so for a very, very difficult year, it's quite a triumph to have an occasion like this where we actually see some of our constituency and some of uh, their friends and the general public. Um, I just hope that you will enjoy this lecture and we'll be uh, considering perhaps joining NCUP. We widened our conditions of entry and you'd be very welcome to contact our executive officer, Cheryl Humphrey, who sent out the invitations if you're interested in joining after it's over. As Roger has said, uh, Sir Anthony will talk for about 40 minutes and there'll be some time for questions at the end. So um, it's my huge pleasure and privilege to introduce Sir Anthony Selden, um, previously the Vice Chancellor of the University of Buckingham and one of Britain's leading contemporary historians, educationalists, commentators, and political biographers. Um, he's the author or editor of over 45 books on contemporary history, including um, insider stories of the last five prime ministers. He is chair of the National Archives Trust was the co-founder and first director of the Institute for Contemporary British History, is co-founder of the Action for Happiness, an historical ad advisor to 10 Downing Street, a member of the government's first World War Culture Committee, and he was chair of the Comment Awards, um, director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, the president of IPEN, which is the International Positive Education Network, a co-founder of the Institute um, for the ethics of AI and education, and as patron or on the board of many charities. Uh, founder of the Via Sacra Western Front Walk and was executive producer of the film Journey's End. So truly a, um, a man of many parts. He was a transformative head for 20 years, first of Brighton College and then Wellington College. He appeared on Desert Island Discs in 2016 and for the last 15 years has given all his money from writing and lecturing to charity. Uh, we're, we're hugely honoured to have him address us uh, today, and his talk is titled A New Vision for HE Post-COVID. Sir Anthony. Well, thank you very much, Janet, and thank you very much, Roger. Thank you very much to um, you all uh, for letting me speak. So... I will go through the slides and then and, um, when we finish the slides, I will get through them in, say, half an hour. Um, so that will leave um, uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes for questions. And my pleasure and thank you to everyone for the patience. All right. Well, I, I, as I said, I'm very honoured to be asked to give the NCUP annual uh, lecture. Thank you very much indeed for this honour. And what a moment to be reflecting on uh, higher education. And I'm going to be arguing that this is a moment for real change. Uh, when we have change in society, it often uh, is prompted by or accelerated by underlying forces are accelerated by a very dramatic event. It could be a, a huge economic downturns such as in the uh, early 1930s uh, or indeed 2008-9 um, saw some significant changes after the great finan global financial uh, crash crisis uh, um, and uh, war we know is um, a, an enormous accelerant of change uh, but so is an epidemic uh, on this scale. And I am going to be arguing that uh, this is the moment for HE to move uh, from, and this is the gist of the whole argument, from being a policy taker, and by that word, policy 
policy, I mean policy for uh, what the objectives of HE uh, is, how it's to be funded, how it's to be delivered, uh, what the content is, to move from being a predominantly decision uh, taker uh, with decisions taken elsewhere to a decision maker, uh, a decision maker, and that COVID um, provides the impetus for what um, uh, many people, including myself, uh, over five years as a vice chancellor, um, felt, and I was puzzled, that universities were not punching their weight. Um, and that uh, the lead is not going to come from government. Uh, government is not um, uh, designed, equipped, to know what to do with higher education. Um, in as far as it has a view, it's a very transactional view uh, about uh, higher education for jobs for the economy um, and or higher education to train the doctors and nurses that we need. Uh, it doesn't have an educational vision, an educational vision or a pure research vision for what it is. Uh, needs and wants higher education to be and into that space indeed into that vacuum HE has to step and HE has to step uh, because nobody else is going to provide uh, that lead uh, until the early 1960s the Robbins report of 1963 and then the uh, arrival of that October 1964 of the Harold Wilson government committed to uh, a white heat and a scientific revolution uh, with a new uh, uh, image, uh, a new vision for universities, government started to become far more involved in the determination of what university policy should be. And I'm saying that we need to go back to that pre-early 1960s era and become uh, our own decision makers. And that is not the least because there are, as you'll hear, uh, an unparalleled 24, I left some out, problems, uh, 24 different problems, uh, which I will uh, talk about uh, afflicting uh, the uh, HE sector. Um, and we need uh, to act as never before in uh, reaching a collective voice. Now, there are a lot of reasons we don't have a collective voice. Um, uh, there is little um, uh, uniting uh, on the face of it. Um, Highlands and Islands University to the University of, of Oxford. Um, there is the Russell Group, which uh, for very understandable reasons is uh, interested in the interests of the Russell Group. Um, universities um, have been encouraged, uh, and not for wholly bad reasons at all, to compete more against each other. What we've lost is that sense of a collective mission, collective vision, collective um, capacity to articulate the overall vision of what higher education is, in which this country has led the world for so many, many years. Uh, and we need to rediscover that collectivity. Now, there is a collective body, Universities UK, for which I have the highest admiration. Um, and that um, uh, body, uh, which it has an outstanding president, um, an outstanding uh, chief executive, Alistair Jarvis, the president obviously rotates, uh, and does extraordinary work. But it is not... Um, it is not equipped to take the kind of leading role that I think that it needs to be taking. And my experience of 25 years of writing about and talking um, intently to figures and side number 10 uh, Downing Street is that they would respect uh, HE much more if it was to um, uh, be far prouder, far stronger, dare I say, an element of fear uh, when um, uh, it engaged with, engages with the higher education sector rather than a slight um, doff your cap. It's so nice that you've come and addressed our annual conference minister. Um, uh, it's so nice that you're uh, consenting to agree to talk to us. If there was just uh, 
Um, number 10 takes uh, people seriously if they take themselves seriously. Uh, and I think there could be more attitude um, uh, and more um, uh, force and more direction. And that would help. I think that UUK does need to have a um, full-time president. This is no criticism of the uh, rotating president model. It isn't the individuals, it's the model. If you're only there for two years, um, and if you are also running your own university, whether Brunel, Liverpool, Kent, etc., um, you know, how can you be expected to give the time that you need to give to running a peak uh, organization? So I think the CBI could be one model, for example, uh, that could be learned about having that full-time chief executive. I would favor somebody who had been uh, a, a much respected vice chancellor for a long uh, time, knows all the people, knows all the issues, knows uh, all the people in Whitehall, in Westminster, uh, in uh, journalism, uh, in the whole, um, uh, knows people throughout the unions, throughout all the um, client and stakeholder groups. Um, an excellent person would be, I'm not advocating him, but just to give you an example, the kind of person I have in mind, it would be either Crew, who I understand has turned down from the position of chairman of um, the chair of the, sorry, chair of the uh, Office for Students, uh, either Crew, who had been um, vice chancellor, uh, amongst many things, at, at the University of uh, Essex, uh, as well as master, uh, I think that's what it is still called, at University College Oxford. Uh, that kind of person, that kind of clout, and that kind of knowledge, that kind of contacts, and freedom, and, and five years to really carry it. I think that uh, the UK could learn more from bodies like HEFI, Irish Education Policy Institute, run by Brilliant McHillman, uh, which with a very small staff really makes the weather week after week. Uh, I think it could learn um, a lot from bodies like um, ASCL, ASCL, Association of School and College Leaders, with its head, uh, Jeff Barton, who is forever all over the press. They could learn from bodies like Resolution Foundation, uh, and the uh, PR and marketing department there, which is again constantly leading the headlines. Uh, and I think that if we do this, we will be newsmakers rather than news takers. We'll be policy uh, makers, not policy takers, agenda setters, not agenda takers. Um, and I think that the crisis of COVID will provide that very moment, that uh, world war moment, uh, or that a uh, huge economic crisis moment to reset the dial, which is what I'm arguing in this talk. So I think um, I will now come through the slides, uh, having set out my stall. Um, and you know, HE is under attack from government. Um, it, uh, it is under attack from uh, the OFS. By under attack, I mean it's constantly having new expectations uh, posed uh, of it, uh, new requirements, uh, um, uh, and from the public, uh, reflected uh, by the media. The public has fallen out of love uh, with universities. It is pointless railing against the Mail or the Sunday Times um, or the Express or, or whatever newspaper it is, the Times, the Telegraph. Um, they are reflecting what their readers are saying, as are their commentators. And rather than being behind the curve, um, sector needs, I think, to be ahead of it. Um, and um, so uh, despite, you know, the sector's under attack, a sector which I absolutely love and was immensely proud of to be a vice chancellor for five years, d despite the, co the, the fantastic COVID contribution, the production of vaccines, the epidemiologists, mathematicians, modelers, economists, um, supplying of doctors and nurses, despite all that, despite the economic impact, the worst recession for 300 years, and the fact that universities are going to be needed to be at the heart of that, despite the political, um, social, um, uh, and economic regeneration needed post-Brexit, uh, you would expect universities to be <laughs> right at the very top. Uh, I don't think the government has a clear policy for HE uh, in the same way that it has for uh, uh, further education. And in as far as it has, it's a very transactional um, uh, vision. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just education is more than um, 
tests and, uh, and exams and providing uh, people for the economy. And by the way, I think that we could be doing a much better uh, job there. It has uh, no clear uh, policy, I'm saying, great chi, uh, on um, new and independent providers. Now, I feel that quite strongly, having run the University of Buckingham, uh, Britain's first um, independent university. It, it was very hard um, uh, with our medical school, uh, with our, our own activities, to find that space and opportunity uh, to allow us to flourish. Um, we did flourish, but it was despite government, uh, not because of government. Uh, funding uh, uh, the sector, I mean, it has uh, all kinds of ideas, uh, but it's far from clear the role of F OFS, what exactly it wants from that with its new chair, teaching and learning uh, regulations, so many, but that vision for education is the main point. The vision for pure research, the vision for what it means to be uh, an educated, um, an educated um, uh, student, um, uh, an educated undergraduate, educated postgraduate. Uh, it, it, we have to supply that. The sector has to supply that. So, looking at HE in 2021, HE should be, I would think, proud, very proud, and very self confident. Certainly deserved to be. I mean, HE has done a, a, a really good job. Uh, despite the headlines um, about the uh, some students, um, I think HE has done something in providing a quality of education for undergraduates and postgraduates, uh, which within the resources that have it available to it, I think has done a very good job, but it's not the job that we hear. It should be celebrated, I think, by government and by OFS uh, far more, and it should be critical and undefensive and taking um, uh, its future into its own hands, um, shaping its own future, not letting others who don't have that pure interest of higher education in heart and who doesn't never will understand higher education as well as the practitioners. Uh, but uh, it feels under attack and demoralised. It suffers from an incoherent and unstrategic government policy and a very um, as I say, a, a, a very transactional government policy. So, um, and it should be core theme of the policy. Um, it is a policy taker, it needs to be a policy maker. So let me now move on to the next section, which is to look at the challenges. Um, and um, I'm sure like you, uh, if you're at a, a wedding and you, um, uh, you, you have a best man speech, and, and it, they say that uh, 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 um, another speech, uh, an afternoon speech, somebody says, you know, I'm going to go through the A to Z, and you think, oh my goodness, please, no. Uh, but I was struck um, by uh, these 24 challenges um, that come up, and the, the, the sector, I, I think it has to be true that the sector has never the leadership of the sector, um, the those who make it up, all the various stakeholders have never had more uh, more to contend with. Um, and and A stands for affordability. Um, and who is going to uh, pick up uh, the tab? Affordability is an extraordinary issue. Um, so is the whole issue um, of BAME uh, access. Um, uh, fair access. Um, and we, there's, there's a scraping. Um, uh, uh, that could be a comment. I'm scraping the barrel here. Uh, but could the, could the scraper uh, perhaps turn off? Could, could, could the scraper mute their? If everyone can mute their uh, switches. Um, okay. Uh, and um, a lot of work. Um, a lot of reports have come out to, to show that uh, not just is it harder to get in to um, Oxford Cambridge, which have been working extremely hard, and other um, of the most academic universities, which have also been working hard. It's very hard to get in, nevertheless, if you do come from the AME background. And then once you're there, your experience uh, often is um, not um, uh, as good and as positive as it can be. Uh, 
which the universities are having to uh, spend a lot of time rightly considering and thinking about. And then China. Um, I remember a discussion um, 18 months ago uh, with um, a group of vice chancellors over lunch um, and with a representative from New UK. And we discussed what the greatest single threat was, and it was the dependency of universities on Chinese students. At the time, the figure mentioned was 106,000, 106,000, and you can all work out what a um, huge impact that is if lost. So the China uh, dependency and the terms of trade uh, have shifted away from China, whereas um, uh, under the Blair government, um, uh, and then Brown, and then very much under David Cameron and George Osborne, a very strongly uh, pro-Chinese um, uh, um, tilt to government policy with uh, premiers uh, visiting checkers under both Brown and um, premier, premiers or presidents uh, visiting under both Gordon Brown as prime minister and David Cameron and uh, a sense that uh, everything was up uh, for grabs um, with China now, um, uh, the, the uh, partly very, very significantly inspired by China's own actions, uh, China has become much more of a hostile force, and yet the dependency on undergraduates and postgraduates and finance uh, in the last week, we've seen um, a lot of suspicion about what Chinese money Chinese influence is doing. Uh, so that's another headache. Uh, it, the, the, the ability to change away from China and to find alternative sources of students and revenue if the drawbridge is pulled up, um, that will take a lot of time to do. Uh, D is for digital. Every single aspect uh, of life at the university is being questioned by uh, digital by, by COVID, even before AI um, and the fourth education uh, revolution with um, mixed reality, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain, internet of things, uh, that whole cluster of uh, AI technologies, which will sweep away uh, exams and change forever the nature of, of um, uh, of testing and assessment and experiments. Um, so um, th th that that is uh, perhaps the biggest challenge. Very interesting uh, article in the uh, Observer of the weekend, looking at uh, whether the university sector is doing nearly enough to embrace uh, all of that. And that's a particular um, theme of my own writing, the fourth education revolution. And then E. Uh, the environment, um, and it's going to, COP26 coming up at the end of this year, it's going to cost a lot of money, quite rightly, obviously, very rightly, but to uh, make our universities far greener, and where is that money going to uh, come uh, from? And the urgency of that with COP26, the urgency of that with all the reports coming about why um, the, uh, this is a bigger threat all the time, is yet another headache for a sector that already has enough headaches. Uh, and F um, is um, further education. Um, uh, there is Hartlepool uh, College um, um, of further education enrolling now. Uh, and the very obvious statement by government, the government um, is um, very much uh, in favour of uh, further education. Um, and uh, what will that do to the sector? And then more generally, um, uh, government policy and who's in charge of it? And um, is it the university's minister, Michel Donnellan? Is it the education secretary uh, with a rapid uh, a turnover of education secretaries, the rapid turnover? Uh, five and five years, or six and five years of uh, university ministers, or is it number 10, which has its own uh, very clear view about HE? Um, and even when it's put together, it's a transactional view of higher education, which is not necessarily our view. 
Uh, and there you are, you, can't, you don't even uh, need me to say uh, that, uh, how this. Uh, so COVID, uh, the enormous disruptions, we come up to towards the first uh, anniversary. Um, uh, the enormous disruption of COVID, which is going to carry on, and there'll be variants, and will there be new epidemics in the future, and what is that uh, going to be saying? Um, uh, Janet mentioned that I'm uh, a governor of the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, and just think there what that means if you are uh, a theatre company with different um, uh, theatres in, uh, in Stratford um, and uh, 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 London, and what is going to be the future of live performance? Uh, and will uh, it ever be the same? Should we be converting to moving all digitally, all uh, outdoor performance? Uh, if so, will the uh, economic finances work out so that you can have enough spacing between uh, bubble groups to allow um, uh, there to be enough revenue to make the performance possible? I mean, the headache uh, of all of this is, um, you know, extraordinary. I, um, well, I, international students, um, and there you have uh, Monash, that has to be one of the ugliest university buildings I have uh, seen. I don't quite know why that one has come up, uh, but Monash, biggest um, university in Australia, enormous threat. Um, uh, we're very, very fortunate, the sector, to have um, uh, the, the former vice chancellor of the University of uh, Exeter um, uh, now is the international uh, champion, um, a phenomenal uh, vice chancellor and university leader who is going to be doing everything he can to uh, uh, ensure that international students were so important in every way, far <laughs> beyond just finance, continue to flow. But the competition is going to uh, increase. Um, and Jay, uh, journalist from across uh, the, the spectrum, and uh, um, I, I do think that um, uh, the commentariat has substantially been lost. Uh, you could say, well, look, the Mail and the Mail on Sunday, the Express, um, uh, the Telegraph, the, the, the pro-Brexit universities, even before Brexit, uh, was a um, was a twinkle in the eyes of um, Bill Cash and uh, Nigel Farage and others that you know even before then they were skeptical about universities. But it's not just them; it's the middle ground of commentators in the Sunday Times and the Times uh, who um, have fallen out of love with universities and the unwillingness. As a brilliant paper by Rosie Bennett. Uh, who is the former education correspondent of the Times, which Happy are publishing, I believe, tomorrow and Thursday, um, and uh, looking uh, at this question. More could and should have been done, uh, not to trash uh, as too many voices in HE and HE outlets do um, uh, the press, but to engage with what is it uh, that is upsetting and concerning then uh, the middle ground of journalism needs to be got back on side and they are reflecting what the public thinks you know the, the, the media sometimes go out on the line but by and large they are in a desperate battle against the digital outlets for readers and they will be saying what their readers uh, want to hear uh, k um key leaders salaries um, and it, it is um, uh, the vice chancellor of Bath was did a ter terrific job at, at Bath. It was unfortunate that uh, that issue, uh, and again the sector rather than um, providing a um, coherent uh, voice and taking action into its own hands, um, and maybe instituting a twenty percent. Uh, cut or at least acknowledging 10% cut, 5% cut, acknowledging that there was an issue, uh, did not uh, respond and was in denial about the damage done to the perception of the sector by um, uh, that leadership. Uh, and of course, if you were a vice chancellor court there, you were just you know fixed in the spotlights. 
Uh, I think that significantly it was the boards of governors that should have not let salaries uh, rise too high. Um, uh, L liquidity, um, which is a uh, growing problem um, for some universities, particularly uh, universities in the um, level leveling up areas, left behind areas, uh, those areas, those universities that are making a cultural, economic, uh, social uh, impact, such a force for good in their uh, community communities are the ones which are suffering and which cannot be afforded um, to, to, to lose. And um, uh, mental health of students, and let us not forget uh, staff and all kinds of, uh, of, of support staff uh, in every uh, position, as well as academics and, and technicians and research staff uh, and others. Um, it, it's is an area where um, uh, a, a very great worry. Um, when I first raised this five years ago, um, obviously lots of other people raised it too, but I was slapped at, um, um, strongly and, and told that, uh, well, what did I know, uh, but also that universities are not therapeutic uh, institutions. Um, and, and there's been um, again, it's been too little, I think, often the wrong kinds of things are too late. Um, and uh, the sector could have got right ahead. The response from the sector on mental health is just, well, let's have more uh, therapists, more counsellors. Um, uh, and that, of course, is important. Um, uh, more um, psychiatrists, more help. Of course, you need that. But you also need need to be providing and linking up with schools more the growth in capacity of the student um, it's akin to um, uh, helping people uh, once they've fallen off the edge of the of waterfall um, or when they've already developed um, uh, the, the, uh, COVID uh, and, and offering them superlative help at that stage we should be doing much more to prevent people by vaccinating them, by giving them the skills to cope much better, including much better policies on alcohol and drugs, which are a contributory factor amongst many to the mental health crisis. Uh, N is, you know, the whole question of, of, you know, is there a need, especially for residential universities, are uh, uh, we needed uh, any more, or can that a uh, person under uh, the tree uh, with her um, uh, unbranded cup of uh, coffee and her laptop be getting all the lectures that she needs, uh, taking part in all the seminars, having the tutorials, doing her research um, for her uh, assignments, be doing her, um, uh, submitting her assignments, getting the feedback, doing our exams, do we need to have universities at all, or indeed uh, residential universities? Um, and there we have the office the students, um, and uh, the government of their wisdom have appointed somebody who admits themselves they don't have a background um, in higher education, uh, when there were other candidates who did. Um, and when it says no friend, um, there's a deliberate intention not to be a friend, you know, to be a regulator. Um, uh, and yet, um, why is the sector not regulating itself more? Why is it putting itself in that vulnerable position? Uh, pensions, well, um, uh, is uh, a constant and ongoing um, concern and worry for universities. Q. I mean, goodness, I'm feeling the exhaustion from you listening to this, but imagine what it's like if you're running a university, whole debate about qualifications, post-qualification entry, the whole reliability, the whole fairness of exams um, during COVID, the uh, 2020 intake, the 2021 intake, uh, somebody on the uh, Today program Yesterday, was it today, a student qualifying uh, this year saying he feels that it's going to be a COVID degree 
and that uh, degree isn't going to be recognized by employers uh, are all these worries and then the whole exam um, factory mentality that this government and uh, all governments uh, globally are obsessed with that exams are testing anything other than the ability to do well at uh, exams. By the way, that will all change um, totally in 10 years' time. Uh, and then uh, what's this going to be about the relevance? Uh, the relevance of the arts and, and the humanities on the slide. You will have seen uh, the reports uh, 10 days ago uh, about um, uh, the decline in these. Are universities merely going to be job, skill, um, uh, agencies that pump uh, the knowledge that you need in, or are we going to have pure education and pure research? Um, and uh, S, uh, speech and, and free speech, no platforming, a, speech, a free speech czar, um, uh, and no platform for fascism. Uh, but is it fascism to deny people the right to speak? within the law, obviously, if they're not going to be uh, breaking the law or inciting hatred. Don't universities um, survive by their ability to ask awkward and difficult and challenging questions and not having a dominant monoculture where people are afraid to say and think and speak uh, things outside? Uh, that whole question is extraordinarily difficult for university leadership to negotiate. Um, and T, um, uh, teaching, and, and, and what the quality of teaching is, uh, and why, again, universities didn't take into their own hands uh, more the uh, um, question about what outstanding teaching is about, and, and but focus less on teaching, frankly, which it should have been on learning, as I'm sure uh, those listening to this uh, will know, that... Uh, um, that it's about learning, it's not actually about teaching. A good teacher is merely a great facilitator of, of, of learning. Uh, it's what the students are thinking about. And to have had a self-improving system uh, whereby departments within universities, faculties, uh, pioneered their own exciting method with student feedback was something, you know, yet again, um, and there's a lot to um, uh, commend the Pierce review um, uh, on um, teaching, but um, you know you, that's all TEF, yet another. And then there's TEF, the knowledge education framework, and there's REF, and on it goes. And there's unions um, uh, which um, uh, do uh, so much that's good, but which also uh, are a thorn in the side of um, uh, of, of university leadership uh, at times. That's uh, right, necessary, obviously, that that should be that different perspective, different voice, uh, but it's a challenge and uh, not least a challenge for Manchester at the moment where students are um, trying to pass a vote of no confidence in the leadership uh, of the university and to be a vice chancellor uh, is a, an uncomfortable uh, process, uh, place to be. And then the unity of the sector, have we lost sight of that? That is um, the uh, Highlands and the Islands at the bottom. Uh, that is uh, Oxford at the top, um, as I posed at the beginning. Have we lost sight of, of what conjoins us? Um, the uh, value for money, um, uh, are students getting it? Should they be uh, recompensed? I think, yes, they should. Um, uh, they should receive some recompense for the last year. This is a much bigger issue just than uh, value for money during the COVID year, which is obviously going to stretch on now till autumn of 2021, and maybe, maybe, I'm afraid, um, beyond that. Uh, but just looking at COVID, should students I think definitely, but I don't think universities should be providing the money. I think that the government should be providing some recompense and acknowledgement to students. Um, and then um, W, which is the last, uh, the whole sense about what it is that universities are supposed to be teaching and the buildings and decolonization. Um, uh, and here uh, is a picture, uh, uh, well, you can see. Um, so all these are very significant uh, worries. Uh, any one of those um, 
24 are significant to themselves, but cumulatively, and there are some out of kindness to you that I've left out, uh, cumulatively, it, it packs a heavy punch. So how might um, we respond just coming to a close? And Janet and Roger, I can't see you, but I'm sure you're thinking, when is he going to um, uh, close down? Any moment is the answer. Uh, don't wait for government or the OFS, um, who are you know, full of good people. Sorry to say that if that upsets people, but they're, you know, they're, they're people doing their best within their remits, but their remit isn't the same remit <laughs> as what HE uh, uh, necessarily uh, has itself. Um, a unified voice. Uh, I think we could be leading on finance much more, leading on AI and ed tech. Leaning on, leaning on teaching and learning, leaning on a common core uh, of uh, what it means, whether you're studying engineering or whether you're studying the history of art or sports science or, or tourism, to have a common core of digital literacy. Um, uh, Joseph Aoun of Northeastern University in Massachusetts uh, talks a lot about this, um, uh, social literacy, um, employment literacy, so that, that, that uh, Mary Cannon Cook, former head of UCAS, is, um, uh, talks a great deal of sense uh, um, and has set up an interesting, uh, important body uh, 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 looking to one of the aspects that's trying to advance this. I mean, there's, we should not just be letting somebody have an engineering or a tourism degree, they need to have um, this uh, common core element that it does include uh, well-being, um, as I put there, and uh, I'd like to see us uh, lead in uh, the other areas too. Universities, to conclude, need to become the policy makers, not the policy takers. Uh, and then I say it's the end, uh, the end of the talk, uh, but not, but not of universities.